like we're, we're mirroring. That is ideal. Okay. Great. So I wasn't looking up when you asked about VR, but I'm not sure I'm on either. Uh, only one person. Oh. Only one person said you didn't like it. They didn't like VR. Oh, great. Yes. Um, well, so how many people have tried out VR? Um, like Oculus Rift. Okay, great. I can dive uh, deeper. Um, so, okay. Is that, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so I'm Shane Scranton. I co-founded Iris VR about a year and a month or two ago. Um, we are at VR Viz, not at uh, Iris VR. That was taken. I like to point that out in the beginning. <laughs> um, and we're essentially doing business applications for virtual reality. It's been marketed as gaming and entertainment, and um, we saw a lot of potential in the built environment and the in the design industries. Um, and to start, I'm actually gonna gonna start with my. Oh, we have a font issue. Well, that's all right. There's not many fonts in here. Um, I'm gonna start with my background. I studied architecture uh, up in Vermont, actually. Oh, geez. And spilling water. And um, I was I was pretty much taken very quickly by um, by the setting of Vermont and the idea of vernacular and building the place. And I went through a bunch of firms while I was in school. I worked at SAS Architects, um, McLeod Cradell Architects. They were doing very modern farmhouses, essentially anchored on the land. Um, I was doing more traditional farmhouses. This was at Connor Homes. They were doing panelized buildings, um, very innovative new technology uh, in the built environment with sort of an old vernacular, which was exciting to work on. Um, and then I had some of my own projects. This was a school project that I worked on um, at Middlebury College and um, got really sort of enamored by the technology that was driving these, these building designs. Um, as you can imagine in Vermont, there's a lot of hesitancy around adopting new technology, especially in old traditions like, like building. And, um, and I was very sold on the idea of improving design efficiency and, and saving money and cost when uh, you're using new d design technologies to get buildings built. Um, so I was really rallying for that. And when I graduated, I decided that a better use of my time would be to really center my skills around the visualization side of architecture. And so I started Lightwell, um, which in this weird font doesn't look like much, but that says Lightwell. And uh, that was a visualization studio where I was essentially doing 3D modeling of, um, of buildings and doing some websites and doing general client presentation material so that an architect could walk into a room with some renderings, with some animations, and uh, show their clients and bring everyone up on the same page. Um, and this was an interesting time. I kind of lucked out. When I started Lightwell, I, uh, I wasn't really aware of what was happening you know, in the industry as a whole, um, but owning my own little consulting agency, I, I, I caught up. And um, there was essentially an industry gamification going on. And uh, I don't know how many people in this room have, tr have sort of tried out different programs in here. I know Floyd has actually spoken um, at Hardwired before. Um, but essentially we have the, the old guard tools like uh, SketchUp and and Autodesk Revit, um, Vectorworks, SolidWorks, all of the CAD tools. Um, and then we have game engines like Unity, uh, CryEngine, Unreal. And um, these were fairly divorced. Game engines essentially make, you make video games out of them. And um, the CAD tools, you're making buildings, you're making designs. And what was emerging when I was at Lightwell was all of these sort of in-between products that were taking all this real-time game tech and moving it into professional spheres, moving it into uh, professional design, built environment stuff. Um, like Blender rolled out a game engine. Lumion was essentially Sims, but for professionals. Um, uh, they probably wouldn't like me describing it that way. Um, Autodesk was rolling out Navisworks, which was a navigable, navigable environment within like Revit and uh, some of the other 3D products. And um, we saw that these these industries were finding it was very communicative. If 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 clients and if designers could walk through their spaces and interact with their spaces like you would in a video game. Um, also, while I was at Lightwell, I, I like to say that 2014, a little bit of 2013, was really the rise of, of, of consumer products that were starting to measure and interact with our 3D environment. I mean, this is going to sound really obvious, but like we're, we're here in 3D and all of our devices are essentially 2D feeds. And um, what happened over the last three years was these little devices that suddenly were scanning spaces. So we have Google Tango. Um, they've really had an amazing run so far, uh, 3D scanner in your pocket, right? 
um, magic leap. No one still can really figure out what they're doing, but we know it's AR and we know it's going to be cool. Um, and like occipital structure sensor, all of these little devices that are essentially taking us into a third dimension in all of our spaces. Um, and of course, what I'm going to talk about, which is virtual reality. Um, and so if you Google architect, and this is what I was studying, right, this is the first image that, that pops up in Google Images. And uh, this drives me crazy because like everything I know about the industry was that like you are, you are thinking about how you interact with a space and how you navigate through a 3D environment. And this is still the, the misconception of what, what we as a profession do. Um, and then comes along the Oculus Rift, right? And everyone's calling it presence. You suddenly feel like you're in the space. So I tried on the Oculus Rift and it was essentially like this is amazing like I can finally understand a space before it's built and I can finally take these CAD tools figure out a way to get them into a game engine and bring them into an environment that is convincing and and takes it to a third dimension which is essentially how we're meant to interpret it um, so this was when Iris started um, and this is when we shut down Lightwell I was working with my co-founder Nate Beatty and uh, we we saw a lot of potential for industry using the this 3D technology to actually understand space. Um, so this is essentially our first uh, six months as a company. This was before Facebook acquired Oculus. So we, um, we were the crazy guys in the room. We were going around with a little back black box, which I have over there. Um, I can set up a demo later if anyone's interested. Um, and we were putting these goggles on as many architects, designers, uh, construction workers, um, and trying to get a feel of if this was technology that was, that was interesting more than just to me. Um, and so after about six months, the Facebook acquisition happened uh, for $2 billion and Oculus got a lot of press and suddenly it became not, will this technology happen? It was, okay, here are $350 goggles that are gonna change the world. And um, with that, we were able to start thinking about how does, how does industry applications of VR actually, actually uh, manifest itself and what can we do in that? Um, so this is where I'll dive in a little bit. We essentially, to make a VR walkthrough right now, you need to make a video game out of a file. So um, the way you do that by hand and the, the way that we started doing it was you start with uh, either a SketchUp or a Revit or a Rhino file, really any 3D geometry, and uh, you clean it up. You have to do these steps. I mean, essentially you're making it a cleaner 3D file so it can be brought into a real-time engine. Um, I usually bring things into 3ds Max, which is a pretty good modeling uh, and mesh tool. You have much more fine control, and you slim it down. You make sure that a computer at runtime can get it to run smoothly, and that you get 75 frames a second, which is important for comfort, and you get really low latency, which makes it um, which makes it responsive with your head movement, and you don't get sick. Um, and so, the, once you once you do that mesh optimization in 3ds Max, you bring it into a video game engine in a sense. So it's either Unity or Unreal. And um, that's when you sort of add flair, you add interactivity, you add gravity, you add physics, you add lighting, and uh, you make a more fully fledged virtual experience. What we saw at Iris really early on was a lot of those steps, everything I've bolded here, is, um, is, is something we could automate, is something that software could do on the back end, is something that really we shouldn't be wasting our time doing because computers are smart enough now that we could write software to do it. Um, so that's where we started, and this is a screenshot of our of our of our earliest prototype app. Um, I'll give a very quick demo. We'll do it live. Be brave about it. Okay. Um, so this is where we are today, and it's a really, really early prototype, but essentially the idea of taking those automatable steps and actually doing it on the back end. So instead of do, having to do it by hand, which can take many, many, many hours and has driven a lot of our clients insane, um, I'll pick a, let's do this guy. So I'll just pick a SketchUp file that's a native 3D file, click open, click launch, and that will go into the stereoscopic view. The, the reason you get two eyes is that's essentially what you look through in the goggles, and you get a, you get a, you get a um, depth perception that way. And you can see each of these images are slightly different, so you get the depth perception. Um, so there you go, I brought this file, it was, it was from SketchUp directly into our app, and then it brings it up into virtual reality. So it, it, if you're looking at it for the first time without having really tackled the problem of virtual reality, this looks very easy, and, and that's actually our goal. The goal is to make this as invisible as possible, 
with this early prototype, it should seem seamless. And if you're a professional working in this field, you should really feel like it hasn't interrupted your workflow. So you can tell it's navigable, you can fly. I can go through some of the features, but essentially we're able to pull a lot of that native data from the 3D file and bring it in here. Um, and that's where we are today. We, we really, this is not where we're ending. And this is, this is an important distinction where we saw that this was a good proof of concept and it was a good way to get people excited and on board Iris. Um, right, we're, we're now allowing this early, early sort of nascent technology to be accessible by professionals doing 3D modeling. Um, what, what has made us really excited about this is we're finally getting use cases back. We're starting to ship this. Um, I should say that SketchUp's free, the, the modeling tool I took this from, and our early access prototype is also free. So anyone that has some goggles that want to sort of play around with ways to get your files into VR, like please sign up for our stuff because it's, 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 totally, it's totally free right now. We're looking for use cases. Um, but really three have cropped up. We, uh, the first and really the obvious one that people think of right off the bat is, is sort of the client walkthrough, which is, um, you're an architect, you have a living room that you're about to pitch your client, you sit them down, you put the goggles on and they walk through and sign off on it. They get it. It's, it's better than a floor plan. Um, the second that was surprising to us that seems to have a larger impact on larger enterprise is coordination. And this is if, say, you're a large uh, construction firm in the city um, and you, you have multiple departments that are working simultaneously on different aspects of a project and you need to bring everyone up to speed in, say, a meeting or actually on site, the best way to do that is to communicate through VR. And um, we've seen that a lot of people are using Iris to actually communicate their designs more effectively among other stakeholders at the company. Um, and the last one that gets me the most excited because it, it has potential to be used the most is um, using VR for actual the design iterations. If we can get VR uh, accessible enough that it's so fast that you can make sort of on the fly changes to say how an eight foot ceiling feels versus a 10 foot ceiling, you can send prototype much quicker in your in your own sort of ideal environment so Good thing the icons say sort of what this is. Um, we've found that we have a lot of industries here. And, and I started in architecture. I came into this like, we're going to sell the architects. And um, it was abundantly clear once we started shipping our really early prototype that there was a whole number of industries outside of architecture that, that design spaces and that design physical 3D things. Um, and so to name sort of the most uh, unique ones is um, game designers themselves are getting ready to to prototype uh, various elements for VR. And we've found that game design studios really want to use our stuff to, to essentially understand what their VR assets are going to look like. Um, also, film and stage and advertising. These guys are all trying to sell clients or directors or producers on, uh, on their recent work on sets or on um, uh, even uh, like film uh, sets. So um, they're essentially using Iris to quickly iterate through that. All right, and then the really fun stuff. And uh, I just got, today, our developer came back from a bit of travel and he gave me this video. And um, this is what we're actually gonna show for Techstars Demo Day. Um, and let's see if it's working. All right, so. Where we're going next is um, essentially trying to get this drag and drop, keeping that idea of keeping the software invisible and keeping it easy to use, um, but building in a much larger feature set that caters to design workflows. So um, this is him in real time doing a screen capture. You'll see that he's changing um, the textures on the floors and the ceilings. This is in VR. You can see the stereoscopic view. Um, this would essentially be a designer uh, designating colors beforehand and then going down and sitting with a client and saying, you know, which options do you like better? Then he's hooked up a, a little wireless controller um, to his hand and he's able to grab different things in the scene and move them around. And this is all happening within the Iris environment. I mean, you can tell this is super early prototype, but it gives you a sense of various different things we're doing. Um, and then one more is lighting, right? And being able to, as the sun goes down, it gets darker inside, the lights turn on, sun comes up, the shadows come in, it gets a little brighter. Um, I'll replay that one more time because it's a little hard to see on here. Um, 
so we have color, material changing, we have uh, interactivity, we have lighting, and then this one is something that I think is a lot of potential for VR that people haven't uh, really explored before. And this is all the places in that space that he has paused at. And it brings up how we do analytics in VR. We're suddenly able to track people moving through space, and we're able to track where they look, and we're able to track sort of how long and how they react in that space. So this is, these bubbles, we didn't really execute on it very well, but these bubbles are different levels of transparency, and the, the ones that are, that are the most opaque um, are the ones that the person spent the longest in. So you could essentially build out data that shows the most comfortable spaces in a building or various other analytical tools. Um, and as you can tell, these are all really early prototype stages, but I wanted to show you guys a little bit of where we were heading. Um, great. And then it sort of goes without saying that mobile VR is taking off as well. We're going to have a cloud system that essentially allows um, these VR walkthroughs to be sent to any device. Um, mobile is promising. It can't render much geometry right now. So we're really restricted to, uh, to what the little phones can render. And we're sticking with PC for the foreseeable future um, until phones get better. Um, and then last but not least is multiplayer. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this use case probably the most because it, it has some very wide real-world applications in how the design world functions. Um, if you are a client in Florida and you're working with GCs in Vermont, let's say, and uh, you need stone from Italy and your uh, designers out in San Francisco, if you can actually get a true sense of scale in a digital space and bring all those people together to do, say, an on-site walkthrough in VR, um, there's a lot of promise for saving travel costs and getting communication lines open earlier. So multiplayer is coming. We're figuring out how we're going to network that in different run times. And, um, and I think here's one last thing. This is Jack again moving uh, the cube around. You can see it's a little wireless device, so that shows you interaction. Um, so that's Iris in a nutshell. I, I, I want to set up a demo at some point after this. Um, I'm not sure if we have space here, but come find me. I'll show you sort of what we're working on. You can put on the goggles. I'll sound less crazy once you are in the space and understand sort of what I say when, true to, when I say true to scale. And um, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much, Shane. Uh, questions? Otherwise, I have questions. Yep, so, uh, so where are we in the cycle with VR? So lots of talk uh, everywhere, lots of excitement. Products are not out just yet. Where, where are we? Yeah, so it was about three weeks ago, it was still a big mystery because Oculus was saying, um, like, we have, uh, we're working on it and it'll come out soon. <laughs> and that was very scary for us as a startup. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for a point when we can have a 1.0 launch. Um, then HTC and Vive had their announcement, which is, um, which is the HTC Vive. It's HTC and Valve, excuse me. And... Uh, it was Valve and Oculus shared a lot of notes early on. Facebook acquired Oculus. There's a lot of speculation around them sort of then splitting and doing their own development. And then out of, out of really left field, um, HTC came in and said, look, we're developing our own goggles. And what was really um, promising for us is HTC said we're releasing it in November. And so now Facebook has a timeline. Now we know that you know probably Facebook won't come out second. They're going to try to beat that to market. Um, and so assuming everyone is a little delayed in their development timelines. We're looking at something around Christmas for VR 1.0 again. Um, and uh, barring any like huge mishaps, it looks like desktop VR will be around this year. Um, and then there's also mobile, which is a different wild card. Uh, but it's getting better. And as the phones get more powerful, I think that's, that's one or two years out. And maybe give us a sense of the level of maturity of what obviously is a very early stage ecosystem, but when when HTC or Facebook come out, what, what will we be able to see? I mean, in addition to professional models through you guys. Uh, Absolutely. So I think um, 
I say I say we need a Toy Story for VR a lot um, because I think that if there is an entertainment hit that is family friendly, that is a better experience than what you can get at the movies. Uh, VR goggles will be sitting next to everyone's TVs in a year and a half. Um, and and I really I'm not even saying that to be hyperbolic. I uh, the the emotional connection you can form with media in VR. Um, is very powerful. Like if my grandma could go to my high school graduation, um, or someone could experience more emotional points in their life again in an immersive way, I see that you know Oculus is projecting potentially 10 million you know sales in the first first year. Um, I think that's realistic. And uh, so, what, what does it take to I guess shoot for VR? So if one wanted to shoot your graduation or one's graduation, what what's required in terms of uh, technology to capture those images? Mm. Yeah, so for, for image capture, um, there's, so I was just at Reality, uh, or Real 2014, which is a reality capture conference, and they, um, it, the, the short answer is you need 3D data to get a really convincing virtual experience, and cameras essentially have to infer how far away things are. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said for a combination of reality capture, which is essentially scanning a space, and then overlaying video on top of that. So you actually get depth when you're in VR. So I'd say there, there's a lot of rigs of hooking up GoPro in an array and you get uh, essentially a spherical view of a space in virtual reality that's that's convincing um, but there's a way to go there I, th I think it will be for 1.0 there, there's gonna be there's gonna be that level of media um, but two or three years down the line you're gonna see scanning coupled with with image capture and then for the goggles themselves for 1.0 it's essentially gonna be um, you know does 0.01 percent of people or, or fewer get sick. Um, right now, with the with the set I have here, it's about one in ten we've seen really feel it. Um, my business partner actually is is one of those uh, one out of ten, so he's a good guinea pig. Um, but yeah, it's 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 gonna be comfort, and um, a lot. We're we're worried that the first VR goggles out there marketed as consumer release are actually gonna be nauseating, and it could hurt the industry. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, um, yeah, uh, if you closer and then I'll pass on my mic too. Would there be any defense applications for this, uh, which you thought of or approach by or approach to any specific? Yeah, so it, it's also I'd say it's larger than uh, defense, and it's it's just entirely uh, training applications. So um, defense is huge. We've also seen safety training. So um, really, anyone that needs to get get acquainted with a new area or a new site or a new piece of machinery, um, we've been approached by a lot of a lot of people in that regard. Um, yeah, a lot of training, even around like how to navigate new environments, which is of course applicable to the to the defense department as well. Yeah, absolutely. One, one right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think it's great. Um, yeah, coming from architecture background as well. Uh, how do you think it will actually affect our um, architecture as an industry when you can basically A-B test spaces before building them and using them? I, that's why I started the company. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that it's needed and. So much so that a lot of the firms I showed at the beginning that are inherently sort of resistant to technology. I mean, we've given demos at all of them, and the, and they're they're some of them are using it with their clients already, and some of them are are on board and and getting set up. And um, it's it's because what what we as designers have in our mind's eye and what is shown to people in the in the production and design process is usually. Uh, it's it's usually not the whole thing, and it's not fully communicated. And with VR, you suddenly have the potential to to actually communicate that that idea. And um, I, I can't articulate it sort of any more concretely than that. But yeah, I think it's a fundamentally new way to communicate with with clients and with coworkers. Great. So uh, unfortunately, that's all of the time we have. But uh, thank you much. You're going to be around up until I guess the end of the event. So if anybody yes. else has questions, uh, there were a few hands over there. You'll be around. Okay, thank you. Thanks much. Appreciate it. That was great. Thank you.